please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Yeah, some things they don't agree on. The Trump is TPP list, for example. Welcome again, folks. Let's start with the markets and get you up to speed there. But we were indicated about 100 points up for the Nikkei 225. We're good for 71 as we speak, taking the barometer to 22,600 or thereabouts. A little bit of inherent softness in the Australian market, the uh, northwest corner, and the Kospi in Korea to tell you about. Uh, let's home in on the SoftBank story this hour. SoftBank says it'll raise its stake in Sprint, the U.S. mobile major just after their U.S. Sprint unit abandoned merger talks with T-Mobile. Uh, SoftBank is also out with earnings today as the calendar would have it along with Sumitomo Mitsui and Mitsubishi, I should say, and Subaru. The car maker shareholders will get their first chance to react to Suzuki's bullish quarter as well. Car maker posting record operating profits uh, in their second quarter and lifting full year forecast by a quarter as well. Shares of advertising firm Asatsu DK are currently uh, trading uh, down at 25 yen, 0, point, uh, 0 and 2 thirds percent. Um, a beneficial that uh, one of the uh, related companies says the private equity firm is extending the deadline for Asatsu to consider its $103 billion takeover bid. Last week, WPP said it was taking legal action against Asatsu, which is its partner to block the deal. Let us get to the rest of the market action. Matt is in uh, Sydney. Let's head out first to June in Seoul again. Hey, June, are your dreams coming true? <laughs> No, Varney, my dreams are not coming true. We're actually looking at a slightly weak start for the Kospi this morning, down about two points from the record levels that we had last week. And the Kosdaq got higher by about a quarter of a percent, so the smaller names outperforming the blue chips. Overall, blue chips opening quite weak at the start. We're looking at the losses for names like LG Chem, SK Hynix. So the tech space a bit weaker than the other sectors this morning. Uh, Apple has uh, sold 140,000 units of its iPhone 8 to smartphone in Korea in the two days after its release. This is weaker than expected for Apple. Just about 60% of the number of sales that they saw for its previous model, the iPhone 7. Uh, the reason could be, of course, people waiting for the iPhone 10 to be released in Korea. It could also be the fact that the Note 8 from Samsung is currently still a very popular uh, in terms of the sales at the local telco stores, but the, the numbers for the iPhone were below expected. We're looking at some weakness for for the tech names in general, but take a look at the electric car battery makers. So LG Chem, Samsung SDI, these companies are sustaining losses from last week on concerns that even the improvement of relations between Korea and China on the trade front may not help the electric car battery maker because the reason may be different uh, for the battery makers, saying, uh, with analysts saying the Chinese government may be looking to move away from Korean batteries permanently to increase competitiveness of the Chinese battery maker. So you're looking at some weakness there. Overall, a slightly weaker start for the Korean markets. Matt, over to you. June, thanks very much. We've got a slightly weaker picture for the Australian market as well an hour into the trading session. Just off by about two points on the ASX 200. Uh, but we've got the All Lords back in positive territory. Will this be the week we see uh, the ASX 200 crack that 6,000 point level, which has been elusive since the financial crisis? The market's sitting around the best levels that we've seen since March of 2015. Aussie dollar 76.47. Of course, this week, Reserve Bank decision on interest rates tomorrow. RBA statement on monetary policy due out later on in the week on Friday. But it's the banks we're watching. Westpac shares lower now by 2.5% after it missed when it came to its full year cash price. Profit up 3% to 8.06 billion dollars, but the market have been looking for a 4% improvement when it comes to Westpac's cash profit performance. Revenue was up by 4%, the net interest margin declining by four basis points. But a big feature of the result was a slump in impairment charges, down 24% over the year-on-year -year period. Uh, I've just showed you the banks. We're also watching ANZ as well today because that company is saying it's uh, going to close its retail banking business in the Philippines. Some big movers today. McGrath, this is in the real estate business, uh, shares sliding more than 25% uh, just a short time ago, now off by 11%. It's issued a profit warning saying trading is below its expectations in the first four months of fiscal 18. Its uh, fiscal 18 EBITDA target of $16.6 million is unlikely to be reached. It says policy changes around foreign buyers are hurting and tighter lending requirements in Australia are having a negative impact. We're also watching 
Orica. Uh, some profit numbers out from that company today. A full year net profit uh, down by 0.7% and the stock sliding as well. Profit coming in at 386.2 million on a 1% decline in revenue over the year. Bernie, back to you. Okay, and uh, earnings in Southeast Asia, a little more detail on DBS, about an hour ago, Singapore Bank, the Development Bank of Singapore reported 25% drop in third quarter net earnings, 822 million Singapore dollars. Net interest income was actually up, the margins were south at 1.73%. Uh, percent. Uh, without an allowance of $815 million, they classified as residual weak oil and gas support services exposure, which they reclassified as non-performing assets. They would have had at $1.8 billion in profits, which would have been their highest ever. But oil and gas proving to be a drag this time. We will be talking to the uh, CEO, uh, Piyush Gupta, later today. Uh, he'll be talking to the folks and NCN team on Capital Connection. Away from corporate news into politics, uh, Donald Trump on his maiden trip to the Asia Pac as president of the U.S. has first stopped the American ally, the erstwhile and very strong ally, Japan. Akiko there tracking the leaders of meet and Akiko. Uh, Trump's due to pay a visit to the Japanese Emperor Akihito and, Prince, and uh, Empress Michiko uh, this morning, too. This is a really serious visit, isn't it? It's, it's, it's almost like meeting the in-laws. That's right. Oh, I don't know about meeting the in-laws, but certainly Japan rolling out the red carpet for the president. Uh, president Trump kicking off his day at this hour, speaking to U.S. and Japanese business leaders before that meeting uh, with Emperor Akihito. But he'll really get in the heart of the agenda later on today, just a few hours from now, where, where he'll be meeting with Prime Minister Shinzo Abe for a working lunch. After that, we'll, uh, we'll be followed by a broader U.S.-Japan economic dialogue and then the press conference following up on that. Uh, North Korea is certainly going to be at the top of the agenda. Uh, the White House is uh, looking to exert a little more pressure, calling on Japan to try and help with U.S. efforts to lobby other countries in the region to get on board with their North Korea uh, policy there. Uh, for the Japanese side of things, they're certainly looking to beef up their defense capabilities, looking to uh, help uh, from the U.S. in terms of upgrading their ballistic missile system as well as anti-submarine warfare. President Trump yesterday upon landing here in Japan addressed U.S. troops uh, talking about the U.S.-Japan alliance and calling it the cornerstone of regional security for the past six decades. And while he did not name North Korean leader Kim Jong-un by name, he did fire this warning shot. History has proven over and over that the road of the tyrant is a steady march toward poverty, suffering, and servitude. But the path of strong nations and free people, certain of their values and confident in their futures, is a proven path toward prosperity and peace. On the issue of North Korea, uh, some reports the White House uh, could be uh, looking to add North Korea to the list of state sponsors of terrorism during this trip, which would certainly be a symbolic move. On the issue of trade, the president has said we will seek free, fair and reciprocal trade in the Indo-Pacific, a nod to the 2016 vision Prime Minister Abe laid out, the free and open Indo-Pacific. Uh, but there may be some disagreements on the issue of a bilateral free trade deal. We did hear from Foreign uh, Minister Taro Kono saying that he did touch on the issue with U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. Japanese officials say they don't plan to raise the issue of free trade. Uh, a bilateral free trade agreement in that uh, dialogue or later bilateral dialogue later today, although White House is certainly hoping to get that on the agenda. Bernie. This is, a, this is the one thing that Trump has been at odds with on Abe. Uh, I mean, they don't have an FTA. The <laughs> Korea and the U.S. have an FTA, but Trump has wanted to, has said he wants to rip that up. You know, if there's one person that could win Trump over on trade, it's going to be Abe. <laughs> what do you think, uh, Akiko? I mean, TPP is still not dead. The certification is still alive. Who knows? Maybe he can win his friend over to come back. Yeah, we are certainly seeing a difference in priorities when it comes to the U.S. and Japan on the issue of trade. Uh, for Japan, the priority, as you point out, Bernie, is to get 
the U.S. back into the TPP. And in a way, they've tried to kind of defer this talk of a bilateral trade deal in hopes that the U.S. will eventually come around. Japan also has negotiations underway with the EU for that broader free trade agreement. For the U.S., we have seen them exert additional pressure. Uh, when uh, the uh, finance minister, Taro Aso, visited with Mike Pence, uh, the reports that that was raised, uh, the free trade agreement was raised as well. Robert Lighthizer raising that issue yesterday, too. So that may be the one area where we could perhaps see some tension on this trip. But broadly speaking, Bernie, this is the friendliest reception the president uh, will get on this broader tour of Asia. I thought it was very clever of Abe to feed uh, U.S. beef uh, hamburgers to uh, uh, President Trump. Uh, I think it was, kind of a, uh, it was kind of a stealth move there. See, if we can get along in trade, you can have more U.S. <laughs> beef and bigger Nebraska ribeyes next time you come here. Thanks, Akiko. Great stuff. We're keeping a very close eye on oil prices after Saudi Arabia's big oil shakeup over the weekend. Boy, what a weekend it was. It's got investors and analysts trying to figure out if it's merely a power grab by the crown prince, MBS, or a step in the right direction for reform. Now, Sri, we were talking with uh, V. Shankarp in the earlier hour who said that, you know, if you're going to do reform in Saudi Arabia, you have to do it in a dramatic fashion. You can't go slow and easy because nothing will happen. Got too many vested interests, and Shankar was positive on this. Yeah, uh, I think that's just one of the schools of thought coming out of uh, this uh, political shake-up, that this was a genuine attempt to really uh, root out uh, endemic uh, corruption. But you've got to appreciate the timing, uh, coming at a point where uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince, 32 years old, is consolidating his power. And some see the anti-corruption drive as something of a smokescreen to him tightening his grip on power. So time will tell uh, which camp is right. But in the here and now, there are issues raised about political uncertainty. There are issues that are going to be raised about uh, the uh, parties that he has gone after and whether they are going to go quietly or put up a fight. And let's not forget that they probably have their own respective support bases. So in the here and now, Bernie, and a lot of people have been telling me this, it's probably going to be expected to uh, see a certain degree of a risk premium uh, on Saudi assets. In other words, global investors will be looking for a higher premium or higher returns to hold Saudi assets. Let's pull up the oil price because I was somewhat surprised that the reaction uh, was relatively muted. We are seeing upside but not a lot. And I was surprised because uh, of this report that uh, a missile believed to have originated from Yemen landed very, very close, or was intercepted rather, from the international airport, near to the international airport uh, at the Saudi capital in uh, Riyadh. So once again, this really uh, raises tension in the region, Bernie, and really underscores the uh, tensions uh, between uh, Saudi and Iran fighting these proxy wars. I think that the risk premium is going to continue building in Saudi assets and arguably this is another tension point for the oil market that they will have to be watching very, very closely indeed. Back to you now. Yeah, we'll watch for any padding on top of the oil prices that we were reporting in the 60s already, last end of last week, Tree. Thank you. We'll be getting live updates from Riyadh uh, later today. Hadley Gamble, we will be joining the Cap uh, Con Capital Connection team at noon. Plus, tune in tomorrow for Hadley's exclusive wide-ranging interview with the Egyptian president. That'll be first thing tomorrow morning right here on CNBC. An update on the tragedy in South Texas this morning. The death toll has risen to 26, with many others injured. A gunman opened fire at a church in Sutherland, about 75 kilometers outside San Antonio. Shooter was found dead from a gunshot wound after driving away, but it is unclear at this point if he shot himself, if it was self-inflicted, or if it was from law enforcement. Weapons will continue to track the story for you.